which was uh, his attempt, uh, more or less, to take his uh, sort of aggressive cost-cutting philosophy and bring it to the world of, uh, of business computing, which uh, didn't really go down too well. So again, rather than having a proper disk drive, it was using these uh, sort of micro drives, which are these yeah, little uh, um, postage stamp-sized things with a tape loop in them. They're horribly unreliable. So yeah, this uh, went down like a lead balloon in the uh, business world. Although one of them did find its way into the hands of a, a certain uh, Finnish uh, student uh, in, who, uh, who uh, had uh, bought a Spectrum with his, uh, his pocket money, uh, sorry, a QL with pocket money, and uh, he used it to tinker around with uh, operating systems. So uh, we all know how that turned out. So uh, in the end, Sinclair had to sell, the, sell off the, uh, the Spectrum's intellectual property to uh, this guy, Alan Sugar. And uh, the computing world moved on. Uh, the, the people moved on to the, sort of, uh, the Atari ST and the Amiga and that sort of thing. And uh, all across the country, the Spectrums generally got handed down to everyone's younger sibling, and, uh, which meant that there were com companies like Codemasters that uh, briefly made a killing out of these sort of cheap and cheerful cartoony adventure games that were sort of attractive to this uh, new younger market and sold for like, just a couple of pounds, so it was just total pocket money stuff. And, uh, and in, the, uh, in the Spectrum community today, I think Dizzy is, is kind of a bit of a Marmite thing. It's, uh, yeah, <laughs> a few nods there. It's, uh, it, it's kind of... In a way, it was the beginning of the end of the, for the spectrum. It's uh, it's like a bit sort of de derivative, and uh, it's uh, and so yeah, they, they 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 carried on for a few years for this sort of thing, but uh, eventually the the supply of software from the likes of Codemasters also dried up, and the magazines uh, um, sort of ran out of things to 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 report on, so they ended up closing down. This is the uh, big final issue, which uh, was big in the sense that it was uh, 64 pages rather than the uh, 32 that it had uh, gone down to. I think there was a general uh, feeling that the, uh, well, the, it's possibly the magazine cover tapes were part of the death of the, uh, the, the Spectrum software industry, because people were saying that these magazines were just a pamphlet with a, with a cover tape on the front. So this sort of, for the people who'd sort of stuck with the spectrum right to the end, we saw suddenly uh, drops of into the lurch a bit. And, uh, and then, well, there was still a community around, and it was being kept alive with these uh, sort of fanzines, this sort of mail order. And it's, uh, in a way, it was a, it's a pretty nice, uh, n nice sort of uh, community in its own way, but uh, it meant we'd kind of turned from it being the mass market thing to us... Uh, being this sort of eccentric preservationist, sort of like uh, like steam engine enthusiasts or something. Incidentally, uh, do you reckon that steam engine enthusiasts get really pissed off with the steampunk people? Because saying, yeah, you're just trying to ride on the coattails of the whole steam engine thing, but you're not actually really living the real thing, you're not really getting into the whole valves and things. So it's, uh, they must get really pissed off with that stuff. Uh, anyway, yes, yeah, so... Um, for a, for a long time, the, this, uh, the spectrum being propped up by these sorts of, uh, of fanzines, and uh, I'll uh, sort of derail a bit into a bit site which I uh, didn't get any slides for, which is another sort of pretty active uh, uh, um, subculture within a, within a subculture of the spectrum, which is the uh, demo scene, which I've uh, sort of mentioned at uh, some length in previous talks, but just as a, re a bit of a recap, this is, well, it, it came out of uh, the uh, um, software piracy scene where pe um, people would, uh, would yeah, pirate these games, uh, break the uh, protection on them, and then to show that they'd, uh, that they'd done this, they'd put in a, a little intro sequence with their logo and some fit, a few flashy colors and things, and, uh, and to, to just as a sort of uh, bit of digital graffiti, as it were. And uh, eventually, this sort of took on its, li its own life as an art form in its own right, and, uh, and people dropped the whole game-cracking side of things and just focused on the demos. And uh, this went on on the spectrum as well. It was uh, perhaps never quite as big as 
things like the Commodore 64 and the Amiga. But um, it, it, was, it was a fun thing to be a part of. It was um, people that were, it was uh, the whole the mail swapping thing and uh, rushing home from school eagerly, uh, sort of hoping that there might be some, uh, sort of some jiffy bag from a far off land like Poland or Czechoslovakia as it was then, and, or so or who knows where. And, uh, and so people were yeah, using these demos as ways of exploring the hardware and uh, just learning new tricks. And it was kind of, and I think that this was kind of, this summarized the Spectrum scene as a whole in this sort of era. It wasn't really driven by commercial pressures. People were able to, uh, to really explore the Spectrum as a platform in its own right. And, uh, and, and really discover um, what's, uh, um, what the, the hardware is really capable of. And uh, one thing really sort of, uh, um, fed into this was the rise of uh, emulators. So we, we didn't really have both feet in the past. We, we did, as well as sticking to the spectrum, we had, uh, we had real computers as well. So emulators sprang up to uh, let you uh, sort of make your PC behave like a spectrum, but with with all of the annoying things like the five minute tape loading times cut out. So, so th th these collections sprang up so you could um, earn like CDs you could get uh, at, uh, in HMV with uh, sort of, uh, emulators and thousands of games that you could just instantly fire up, uh, and, uh, and and so so yeah, this was uh, and and. Uh, time, as, as time went on, people discovered a lot more. Uh, these emulators became more and more accurate, uh, and as well, once the hardware was capable of emulating it at a lower and lower level. So, so, so the so as we discovered more about the spectrum, these uh, emulators uh, improved as well. Now. Around the middle to the end of the 90s, uh, a, a lucky few of us uh, got access to the internet, and uh, what we found was, uh, was something quite surprising, was that uh, what we thought was this sort of little, um, little island, uh, this, this, um, this sort of tiny close-knit community was just like one island out of many. And uh, so one, once people got onto the internet, started Googling, or not, not Googling, Alta Vistaring or whatever for, uh, for the spectrum, we were discovering these other, so other things happening around the world that we'd kind of missed out on the first time round. And so, um, so one example of this was um, in, during the, uh, the Sarajevo War. There were um, a, a few, a, a, a couple of guys who, uh, in order to distract them from the horrors of this, they um, worked on uh, an, an, a Spectrum emulator of their own. And there's it's an incredible story behind this of how they, they, they would have like maybe one or two hours of electricity a day and uh, well, they probably have power cuts like we had just before, but uh, um, so during that they'd be coding frantically, and then during the rest of the time they'd be uh, just working out uh, algorithms on paper, and uh, and and in in the end they uh, came up with something that was a pretty easy and competitive emulator for uh, against the other things that existed at the time, um, and uh, and. And it's really sort of amazing what they came up with there. Uh, and so other, bit, other sort of bits of, uh, um, the, of where, a place where it tied in with the European history is the... Um, so there was... Uh, um, in, in, in the city of Torun in Poland, it, uh, we, it turned out there was um, this uh, signal, a TV signal intrusion uh, staged by the uh, Solidarnosc... Uh, of anti-Soviet uh, movement, and uh, th this was uh, done by a, a couple of uh, academics uh, at uh, Toron uh, University uh, using a spectrum and this series uh, of random uh, bits of electronics. So uh, the spectrum's obviously been an inspiration to hackers uh, throughout the ages, and, uh, it's, and it's also interesting to see how it's sort of feeding into these moments of European history. It's like the, the spectrum is this sort of computer equivalent to Forrest Gump. It's this underdog <laughs> where it's, uh, it's sort of surfacing every now and then and uh, in these uh, unexpected ways. But uh, perhaps the uh, sort of most intriguing of all was uh, what was going on uh, in, uh, in Russia. Because um, it turned out that... Um, so, 
So the, uh, the, the, the spectrum, it turns out at some point, someone had managed to smuggle uh, an original spectrum through the, uh, the Iron Curtain. And uh, because, because of the, uh, um, the, 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 the way that Sinclair had, had sort of driven down the costs and eliminated all this custom circuitry, like uh, Ben Heck was saying about uh, th there was only really one custom chip, and uh, if you were determined enough, you could replicate that in standard logic. And that's exactly what uh, what uh, the uh, boffins in Russia did. They uh, came up with these uh, um, these designs that were basically that they got sort of pa passed around just these blueprints for these. Uh, spectrums reinvented with, uh, with with the locally available components, and pretty much every city and town in in the Soviet Union that would have some kind of uh, electronics geek who would be uh, who, who, who would be have this little cottage industry of making these spectrums out of whatever bits and pieces they had to have they had to hand with these uh, whichever sort of, uh, sort of you know, keyboards and things, whatever, bits of plastic. Uh, so it's all sorts of, uh, yeah, what, like, really, whatever materials they had to hand. Uh, so if they had like a job lot of these uh, five pin DIN sockets, then that's what they would use for all the connectors, regardless of whether it's actually made any sense for that particular application. Because, yeah, it just make, make do with uh, whatever materials I had available. This is the Sinclair philosophy reborn, effectively. And uh, the, the uh, sort of intriguing thing with this was that um, the big, um, along with all the hardware, of course, came the software, pirated, of course, and, uh, and, and they, in fact, had disk systems because, uh, the, well, they, the, it was... Uh, Bigger, they, they 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 kind of adopted one British uh, disk system. The, the Sinclair never brought out an official disk uh, system. He was still insistent on the microdrive stuff. But uh, there's a couple of third-party ones, and one of them, a fairly obscure one called Beta Disk, it uh, found its way to Russia, and that became their standard. So they they would receive these uh, discs of pirated games for, for, from their sort of a local dealer, and uh, because the, um, this was all happening in the sort of beginning of the 90s, they didn't really experience the whole progression of uh, of the of video games as we knew it. So um, so uh, so things like sort of Jet Set Willy that meant absolutely nothing to them because um, they would sort of get these discs with like hundreds of games on and. Well, for a Russian kid growing up uh, um, with, with these things all at once, well, which one of them are you going to sort of leap on and say, yes, this is state of the art? And obviously it's going to be the Dizzy games. So these games that we uh, in the West were kind of uh, thinking this was like the, uh, the low point of the, of the, of the Spectrum's uh, uh, software output. In, in Russia, this was, yeah, th th this was like the absolute peak of, uh, of achievements, though Spectrum nostalgia in Russia is now is all about Dizzy. So, yeah. <laughs> Jet Set Willy, Manic Miner means nothing. So now, yeah, we've, uh, we've come uh, sort of full circle in a way with the Spectrum's uh, sort of uh, fashionable and retro again. Uh, so, yeah, see these bags and things. And uh, this uh, ZX500 tra uh, trainer, that is an actual Adidas product a few years back. Uh, I don't, don't think they acknowledged that it was an officially licensed, but you can see what they were doing there. So, um, yeah. And, and so things are still going on uh, to, with the, the Spectrum community. People are still discovering stuff. There's collaboration over the internet. So this is uh, one thing that I have uh, had to uh, put in uh, uh, after uh, in Ben Heck's talk. There, there's a talk of uh, uh, recreating the, uh, the the ULA, the custom video chip, in discrete hardware. So this is um, the the prototype of the uh, Harlequin, which is. Uh, 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 Spectrum clone, which was built by uh, a guy called Chris Smith, uh, who's based in Wales. And he actually brought this along to a gathering of Spectrum geeks at a pub in Oxford. So, uh, we, so the, these things go on every now and then. And uh, I have to say, when the, uh, the, the barmaids sort of came along to our table and saw this sort of mass of uh, components and wires, she was uh, a bit uh, apprehensive and was like, is that a bomb? 
<laughs> so, uh, and yeah, so I, it, it, I think it, it, it lost a bit of the through the connections got loose in transit. So uh, I think once we fi finally got it working, we dared one of our party to shout out, the bomb's working. <laughs> so uh, yes, fun times. And uh, another uh, sort of uh, major achievement uh, of these, uh, these uh, Oxford uh, pub meetups was, um, well, it was we also had the... the um, a first glimpse of the Spectranet, which is the, uh, uh, an Ethernet interface for, for the Spectrum. Uh, and it's a uh, thing with the, a lot of these interfaces, you end up with the, uh, the, the interface themselves are actually kind of doing, the, yeah, th they have as much processing power on board as the original Spectrum, if not more. But it's still a, yeah, a nice intellectual pursuit. And, uh, and so, so one one thing that so we we got the like the first prototypes of this so we were playing around with them at one of these uh, meetings in Oxford, and uh, we decided uh, on the spot that what we'd try and do is uh, get the spectrum uh, posting to Twitter. So this was again this the the uh, the, um, the much missed uh, Gloucester Arms in Oxford, and uh, this was uh, the <laughs> the uh, tweet from a spectrum that we sent from. Uh, from the spectrum to a laptop that was bridged to the uh, local Wi-Fi hotspot. So uh, I do think there really should be like a blue plaque on this uh, on this pub now. There's uh, the first spectrum. The spectrum tweet was sent from here. Unfortunately, you can't do this anymore because um, uh, they, they've now they've enforced like OAuth and all sorts of things. And uh, but for a while, the guy who, uh, who produced the, uh, the the Spectrenet interface, he would like go to these retro computing fairs and uh, he would have uh, a, a Spectrum set up with uh, with the a, a Twitter client where you could put in your username and password, and and people would go, "Look, Mom, I'm posting from a Spectrum on Twitter." That's pretty much all everyone typed, but. Uh, but yeah, you can't do that now because uh, you've got to authenticate via OAuth. But because, well, to be fair, um, I, I think it was the entire point of Twitter moving to OAuth was to stop pe people setting up random bits of hardware saying, go on, enter your username and password into this box. It'll do something cool. So you can't really blame them on that. Uh, so yeah, um, the uh, Specky 2010, which is the um, um, sacrilegious uh, spectrum in an uh, FPGA um, that uh, they, it is uh, developed by uh, a, a Ukrainian developer, and this is actually my pride and joy. I'm uh, using this for my uh, concert later on. Uh, it's, uh, it's a nice uh, compact thing. And, uh, uh, so, so yes, these sorts of developments are uh, happening all the time. It's, uh, it's really sort of fascinating international community. Uh, oh yes, and incidentally, with the, the issue with some of these, uh, um, the, uh, the, these clones, if you're trying to make them above board, there's an issue with the Spectrum firmware, because since it was passed on from uh, Sinclair to, uh, to Amstrad, the uh, intellectual property now ultimately resides with uh, Rupert Murdoch. So uh, um, if you actually want to, to build these things and ship them with the, uh, the Spectrum ROM, then uh, you would have to sort of come up with some, uh, some deal with, uh, with him. <laughs> So as, as a way of uh, getting around this, uh, I actually uh, worked on a project a few years back to like, produce an open source clone of the, um, of the Spectrum firmware that would, that would actually re reproduce like basic, the, let, let it run basic programs and so it would be enough to like, run games and things. And, uh, and one sort of coup for this project was that we sort of got hold of the uh, ZX81 uh, firmware, which due to... Uh, and various of legal oddities didn't go to Sky, so we were able to um, to to use some of the routines from there, which had then been passed on to the Spectrum, and uh, those uh, included the um, the trigonometric uh, math routines. So not only to, did I eventually find out what sine, cos, and, di and tan did, I eventually to became the custodian of the sine, cos, and tan routines. So and now, now it sort of made me I really realized that this is, must be what like, like, Stephen Moffat feels when growing up watching Doctor Who and then, uh, and, and then eventually becoming a writer on, on Doctor Who himself and be, running the show. And it's, uh, well, simple pleasures. It made me happy. And uh, of course, now we've got um, the, the likes of the Raspberry Pi to um, keep, um, so, so, to, to really bring back this idea of a computer that encourages programming from the get-go rather than a computer that's uh, just an appliance. And uh, 
yeah, it's uh, obviously, as we all know, it's a roaring success. And it's, uh, it's ho hopefully going to, um, to inspire a new generation of programmers just as uh, I was uh, with the Spectrum. And it uh, might not have the, uh, the, the keywords printed on the keys, but uh, if it can help a few of the uh, children of today uh, slay their own bug-eyed monsters, then I think that uh, the future's bright. So, uh, thanks very much. <laughs>